Good evening, YouTube. Welcome back to my channel. It's been a long time. And I'm here to do another movie log, which has been quite a while since I've done one of those. But I like to talk about a few things that I've picked up lately, a couple of things that I've watched. And uh, so let's get started. I got the new copy of Monster Bash magazine a couple of weeks ago. This is issue number 50 with Frankenstein on the cover and Dracula on the back. By the way, I am supposed to be going to this convention, the Monster Bash, in June, okay, in Pennsylvania. The first vacation I've had since before the pandemic. Uh, I went I went to the Horror Hound Convention, Horror Hound Convention, in Indianapolis in the summer of, of uh, 2019. That's the last time I've been anywhere. I mean, just anywhere at all, right? So... I uh, I signed up to go to this convention last year, and I ended up canceling. So I'm hoping I don't, I don't do the same thing now because I am so lazy. The idea of jumping in the car and driving, you know, 40,000 miles just does not appeal to me at all. But I, I need to shake myself out of my laziness, so I'm I'm going to force myself to go. Anyway, so I, I picked up this bag. Well, the magazine came in the mail because I subscribed, and it has a nice article all about the actress Allison Hayes. Beautiful Allison Hayes, the 50-foot woman, also in other films like uh, this little jungle epic called The Disembodied. And they have a coupon in here to buy Disembodied, right? They're trying to promote their uh, sales. And I just couldn't bring myself to cut the coupon out of the magazine. So I went online to uh, creepyclassics.com, which sponsors the Monster Bash convention and uh, puts out this magazine and a lot of terrific films and posters, all, all kinds of really cool stuff. I'll put a link down below because you need to you need to uh, check out Creepy Classics. So I decided to buy a few things, including The Disembodied, which I have not seen probably for 40 years. I don't really remember it very much, but I think Allison Hayes uh, plays a jungle witch who turns men into zombies or something like that. Something really nefarious, right? She's a gorgeous actress. And while I was online, I picked up another couple of things, one of which was, this is actually from Vinegar Syndrome, but I picked it up from Creepy Classics, Kuruku, Beast of the Amazon, a horror film from 1958 starring John Bromfield and Beverly Garland, which I've never seen, directed by Kurt Siodmak, who, who directed a lot of terrific uh, horror films, film noirs, and somehow he got stuck doing this in 1958, but I don't know anything about it. I actually bought this bootleg at a flea market about a thousand years ago, and the imagery is so bad that I, I watched it for about 10 minutes, and I thought, I can't even can't even make out the shapes of the people, you know, or the what's going on. I couldn't see the monster, so uh, I don't know why I kept this all these years, but I, I did. But I finally decided to upgrade here. This is a nice... Nice little package. They, they do good stuff at uh, Vinegar Syndrome. Nice artwork. Nice slip case. Here's the uh, cover. And the inside has, of course, an alternate cover. And there's also artwork on the disc, which is very cool. Okay. Here's the poster for the film. And I'm a big fan of Beverly Garland. She was uh, another terrific genre star from the 1950s and up into the 60s so uh i think this will be a lot of fun karuku beast of the amazon what a title man and while i was there i also picked up uh something else i picked up this is from screen factory but again i bought it through creepy classics the mask of the red death starring vincent price 1964 one of roger corman's best most uh colorful and hypnotic uh, uh uses of color for this Edgar Allan Poe adaptation. Just a terrific film. Of course, I picked this up on Impulse, remembering later that I already had this movie on Blu-ray in this Vincent Price collection, which I picked up a year or so ago. I just completely forgot that I had this movie. Of course, I also have it on a Midnight Movies DVD collection, but uh, I wanted to get it on Blu-ray. So anyway, this is going to go to a friend of mine named Harry Benson who I've already promised it to. Harry, keep looking at the mail because it, it will be there eventually. Harry is also getting my True Romance box set, which I talked about in a previous video about a month ago. Uh, 
Okay, so I picked this up on Impulse at Barnes & Noble, watched it once, and was not a fan. So I'm, no, I'm never going to watch this again. So even the presence of Dennis Hopper cannot save this, this film for me. But uh, it does have some good things about it. Now, I know a lot of people love this movie, so I'm not going to get into a discussion about it. But I'm very happy to give this to Harry. So Harry, watch your mailbox. But again, I'm very lazy, so it will probably take me a while to get these both to you. The Creepy Classics box set uh, package came today, and I was waiting for it so I could send them both at the same time. So I'll try to get these in the mail very soon. Anyway, I also visited my uh, local disc replay, picked up a few items, and two of them are these Film Noir Archive, um, mostly Columbia films on Blu-ray. And a lot of these I've seen, but... Uh, and a lot of them I've seen online, where I have uh, cheaper copies on DVD. Things like Rubble on the Docks with James Darren, uh, The Long Haul, uh, titles like, let's see, what are some of these titles? Man, it's hard to read. These things are so small, but here's here's everything that it has back here. It has the posters. Okay, and this one, three discs in each package. one called um, Spin a Dark Web. That's a great title. Uh, I watched one last night. It's an English film called uh, Footsteps in the Fog, a, a beautiful color film with Stuart Granger and Gene Simmons, which which is, is not really a film noir at all, I don't think. In fact, most of these aren't. I would not classify these as being noirs myself, but I know that that definition continues to expand, so... Anyway, very happy to have these. All right, and I picked up uh, four other items on DVD. One is this English film all about Oscar, Oscar Wilde, which I'd never heard of before. Stephen Fry plays Oscar Wilde. Jude Law is in it. Vanessa Redgrave, uh, Tom Wilkinson, Jennifer Ely, and uh, Michael Sheen. Uh, pretty good adaptation of this, this man's life, or I should say a version of this man's life. Uh, his adult life and how he came into ruin and uh, it, it, it's kind of sympathetic but not really it doesn't make the man into a hero it doesn't make him into a villain the, the film kind of steps back and just shows what happened and what what he was doing with his life and the people around him and lets the viewer make their own decision how they feel about Oscar Wilde okay it's certainly a brilliant writer and then I also picked up this book this book this film from 1962 called David and Lisa, directed by Frank Perry, starring Keir Dulia, uh, Dulier. I always pronounce that name wrong, so free, feel free to correct me. Keir Dulier and Janet Margolin as a couple of teenagers who are mentally ill, and they are both in this, this private school for mentally ill students to try to get them to communicate and work out their lives. And... I had never seen it before. 1962, I was 11 years old. I always remember this poster. It was a very cool poster of these two faces blending together in black, good black and white photography, directed by Frank Perry, as I, as I said. I uh, have mixed feelings about this movie. It, it had a lot of incredibly good moments. I like Keir Dulier as an actor. Dulia. Uh, Janet Margolin, I feel, is a little bit less talented, but she wasn't given a lot to do. And I... This, this movie is very self-conscious. I get the feeling that they're trying to hammer it into the brain of the viewer. You are now watching an art film. This is an art film scene. You must pay attention. You must react as if you are watching an art house film. Okay. But I think when you have an art house film, you might actually combine it with uh, intelligent dialogue, which is lacking in many of these scenes. And um, for, for example, Janet Margolin plays a schizophrenic and she only communicates in poetry, which I guess is something that happens in real life, but there's just something about the way they do it here. And maybe it's her acting that makes it seem just unbelievable and a little bit um, comical. And Keir Dulier's character is uh, kind of a mixed bag of a person, that, not terribly sympathetic, not, not at all likable. And uh, but anyway, I intend to watch this again. Maybe there's something I'm missing, which happens to me quite a bit when I watch a film. I need to watch it again to really uh, get what I'm supposed to get. Another film I picked up 
from 1954, this romantic uh, comedy drama called Three Coins in the Fountain, starring Clifton Webb, Dorothy McGuire, Jean Peters, Louis Jordan, Rosanna Brazzi, and Maggie McNamara, who is on the cover here, but strangely enough, she's not listed. She's actually the star of the film. She's not listed on these, uh, these actors. Beautiful cinemascope color film takes place in Rome. It's, it's like a travelogue of Rome back in, in 1954. It's absolutely beautiful. Won a couple of Academy Awards, and it was very controversial at the time, and maybe for some people today, because the uh, sexuality, <clears throat> which is certainly not graphic for 1954, but it's, it's suggested that uh, there are unmarried people who are living together and being sexually active, which uh, was a scandalous thing in the 1950s. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that the the, the uh, religious establishments condemned the film, and which of course made it a massive hit. It was a big, big hit, and it's still talked about today. There's a, a um, commentary by a, a brilliant film historian named Jean Janine Basinger which I intend to listen to because I think she talks about the controversy at the time. But anyway, it's a beautiful film to look at. I'm glad I finally got it. And another film I picked, out is, picked up is one I've never seen, The Sons of Katie Elder with John Wayne and uh, Dean Martin, Michael Anderson Jr., let's see, Martha Heyer, Earl Holloman, Jeremy Slate, and Dennis Hopper, directed by Henry Hathaway. So never seen it, so I'm glad I finally have it. Another couple of things I picked up, I decided to upgrade Chinatown to a Blu-ray. Picked this up at Barnes & Noble. This is a beautiful, beautiful film noir. And uh, it would be nice to see it on Blu-ray. So, yeah. I am double dipping, folks. <clears throat> I also picked up today at Walmart. Oh, great. This is going to strike 12. So, have fun. I picked up Season 1 of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which I have not seen I've heard many people, my, my Trekkie friends, talking about it and how good it is. It kind of brings back the old feeling of the old Star Trek. So I thought, you know, it was uh, not that expensive. I thought I would check it out. And besides, it's recommended by Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know about you, but I never make a move unless I check Rotten Tomatoes first. I'm kidding. So anyway, it says, the best Star Trek show in decades. And it goes back to the time when... Actually, the very beginning of the Star Trek saga, the first pilot, it has uh, Captain Christopher Pike. And I don't know who the actors are at all. So if anybody knows about this, you can tell me. And one more final thing. I read this cool book called The Way They Were, which is all about the making of the film The Way We Were with Robert Redford and Barbara Streisand. And it says, how epic battles and bruised egos. These are egos right here, okay? Here's an ego, here's one right next to him. And uh, bruised egos brought a classic Hollywood love story to the screen. So it was kind of a fun book. Um, again, it's not a great book. It's kind of a mixed bag of a book because it, I thought it was going to concentrate more on what actually happened between these people on the set. And there, were, there was quite a bit of that, but most of it was the, the first part of the book and the last half is all the background of the people who were uh, writing and producing. Uh, Arthur Lawrence, the writer, um, Ray Stark, the producer, Sidney Pollack, the director. And it's, it was more about them and their histories, I think, than it was really about Strice at a Redford, which is the, the part that I really care about. But anyway, it was kind of fun. So anybody read this? Anyway, that's my uh, movie log for today. And hopefully there will be others that follow. So comments are welcome. Thanks a lot, folks.